Welcome everyone and thanks for attending. My name is Nathan Richter. I'm the Vice President of Program Strategy and Insights at Dynamic Yield and I'll be one of your hosts for today's webinar. I'm lucky enough to be joined by Alex Fitzgerald, one of our Senior Customer Success Managers here at Dynamic Yield as we discuss COVID-19 and how retailers are working to meet consumer demands during this global pandemic. A little housekeeping before we get started. Let's look at our agenda. We'll go through some further intros, talk about COVID-19's business impact, some market trends we're seeing on the Dynamic Yield platform, the different phases that we see brands responding with, some main CX themes that have emerged, and then examples of effective use cases being implemented across our portfolios. So without further ado, let's dig in. As the leader of the strategy and insights team, I'm helping clients identify and execute on the opportunities to build a robust personalization program. This involves everything from data analysis to organizational alignment. Alex, why don't you share a little bit about yourself as well? Hi everyone, my name is Alex Fitzgerald. I'm a senior customer success manager here at Dynamic Yield. Um, I work with clients across a lot of different verticals, everything from fashion and accessories to home building and um, real estate. So I, I really have a, a diversity of experience dealing with different clients, different challenges. Uh, my background um, is diverse as well. I've worked in email marketing, I've worked in uh, paid acquisition marketing, and I have a background in finance as well. Um, so I am excited to talk to you about some specific use cases that our clients have launched in response to COVID-19. Great. Thanks, Alex. So where are we at right now? Well, this is undoubtedly an unprecedented time. For all types of brands, whether you're a Fortune 500 or a pure play startup, COVID-19 has really changed the dynamics of your operation. What we're seeing is not only an impact as it relates to the consumer behavior, but just as importantly, an impact to how brands are operating and able to function. So the internal teams dealing with how we're uh, organizationally aligned, working from home, new communication methods, we're really defining a whole new era. What we want to highlight is a little bit of the market trends that we're seeing from the consumer side through the eyes of our platform. The Dynamic Yield platform has hundreds of clients and millions of sessions that we're observing daily. By parsing through some of this data, we're starting to see some early trends of certainly what was some net new behavior very early, but some potential normalization of now how consumers are wanting or needing to interact with brands. So what was the first thing we saw? Well, February and March, as we know, are a bit of a transition period. Coming out of the high peaks of the season, of the holiday season, we tend to see a drop off in a lot of activity. This is also a key rotational time for a lot of merchants in the retail or e-commerce sections as you're transferring again from more winter inventory into the summer uh, activities. So what we saw here was a spike in actual activity around the 16th to 18th, so some of those initial timelines there. Um, after that initial bump, though, it was interesting to see a little bit of a leveling off. Breaking that down by vertical, we start to see some other trends emerge. So as you see a bit of the normalization here from left to right, we're looking at February through the end of March. This is a week over week comparison of the number of daily users. So if we're above the line, that means week over week we're increasing in those verticals, where if we're below the line, we're seeing some drop offs. The interesting trend is if you look at the transition from February to March in the middle, week over week was really pretty standard as we would expect from some typical seasonality curves. But as we get into the second, third week of March, and specifically around that March 22nd timeframe, we start to see some real volatility both ways and see the trends that are continuing now. So certainly home and furniture, apparel and accessories, and even beauty and personal care have really spiked as of recent but we've seen a dramatic drop off in luxury and jewelry and apparel and accessories drop off quite a bit. And I think that speaks to what are the essentials or what are people looking for? Certainly as we'll find in some later slides, the activity is still there, but on a macro level, people are starting to focus in some of those areas that are a little more uh, maybe necessary in a day-to-day -day sense. The next piece is how does this apply with the conversion rate uh, and thinking about it through the lens of what might have been happening in the mass media as it related to the number of confirmed cases of COVID. So the trend line that you're seeing in the squiggly line is the conversion rate metric as we see it across our platform. 
And the quick ramp up on the bar chart or in the, the curve chart there is saying actual confirmed cases that we see of COVID. So there towards the beginning of April, it's uh, close to a million confirmed global cases. Uh, the conversion rate, as you see, going from the beginning of the year, again, through to the beginning of April, while had been pretty standardized, sticking around uh, 1.4, 1.3, shot up quite a bit to 1.6 and we've seen it as high as seven or eight percent on some of our different verticals as well. So we are seeing uh, with that extra traffic, normally we, we might expect to see a bit of a dip in conversion because extra eyeballs don't always mean extra conversion. We're actually seeing uh, the conversions follow the traffic, which is at least one positive we can take out of uh, what is this change in behavior and necessity. Card abandonment. Logically speaking, the more sessions, the more traffic we have, even with an increase in the conversion, we're going to be increasing that card abandonment rate all overall, excuse me. The one thing we wanna call out here, in addition to just the percentage and seeing that increase, which again is logical because we have extra sessions. I think what's important to think about this as brands and retailers is that extra card abandonment volume is actually a really uh, excellent opportunity to do some remarketing and some retargeting. So when you think about the card abandonment triggers or messaging you can do, um, the one positive to take from the extra abandonment volume is the fact that that's actually giving us as retailers or as brands additional opportunities to reach back out and re-engage with that consumer based on that abandoned session. So really dig into these metrics on your site, understand if you're seeing the same trend line and think about what are some of the uh, mechanisms you have to retarget those users because they had obviously gotten to that point of intent within the cart where they'd highlighted what they thought your brand could provide within this time therefore could still be in market even if you missed out on this conversion letting them know that you're there and available for them the next time they need that item volume of purchases so in following with the conversions and the traffic this is a raw number that is showing an increase uh, year to date, so year over year as well. The blue lines here representing 2019, the next to it bar charts in orange representing 2020, so a comparison. Week one is the beginning of this year. So you can see again, a, a bit of a normalized trend what we're seeing. We had already been seeing some good growth across the uh, verticals as it related to overall purchase volume. So we were off to a good start in the year overall. Uh, but you can see that as we moved into March, the seasonality trend was really starting to drop off and based on, um, again, just the circumstances that we're in now, that increased traffic, increased conversion has led to some of our peak weeks that we don't traditionally see at this time. So that week 14 number of 5,100 conversions or purchases, I should say, um, is something out of the ordinary, both on the seasonality curve and just a raw volume number as we look at it compared to the rest of the year. So thinking about, um, what you're seeing those purchases be, uh, what are the items in there? I think that's something we are interested to dig into and that's what we looked at as well. So using this trend again, I know a bit of a crowded slide here, uh, but as we talked about, this is a week over week comparison, different verticals represented by the different colors. If we're above, it means that week over week is an improving trend line. If we're below, it's off. So if you remember on the previous one around some of the uh, user and session activity, by that last week of March and the first week of April, we still had some laggards that uh, were dropping off. Well, the purchase volume, we are now seeing an across the board uh, jump as it relates in week over week purchase volume, which we think at least is a positive trend as again, consumers have most likely settled in, understanding where and what they're gonna need to do to both get the shopping essentials as well as some other um, maybe lifestyle items. So they are migrating more online and those purchases are up. I think as multi-channel retailers understand, unfortunately, this uh, increase in purchase volume is not offsetting uh, the closure of stores or some of the multi-channel buying, but at least we are seeing that behavior shift and we are getting that extra purchase activity here. Um, so one small positive, even those earlier ones, uh, like the luxury space and apparel, even those are up uh, in the recent week over week models. But what has that shown us as it relates to items in the transaction? So traffic's up, purchases are up for the most part. Um, but the interesting dynamic that we did see coming out of our own data sets is within the order, the number of items in there is actually decreasing. 
Again, this is a week over week comparison of the number of items within each transaction that we're observing within our platform. So while there's a little bit of an increase uh, from the beginning of March to the middle, kind of similar week over week, we then saw a dramatic drop off. What do we think this was? Well, similar trend as you see in our average order value drop. Uh, the theory here is that as consumers are coming, the purchases are up, but they're being much more specialized or focused in the items that they're purchasing from you and your brands. And I'm sure you're seeing similar data as you're evaluating your different cart makeups. But it does give us, I think, a really powerful set of information here when we think about how we're merchandising our site, promoting different offers or different value propositions, is knowing that consumers are coming for much more specialized or singular items what does that mean as you present those areas uh, or present those different categories or even specific products throughout the site experience? How do you take that information that you see as the um, you know, top sellers or best sellers, making sure those might even be manually merchandised on your homepage, promoted in your emails? There's a lot of insight that can be, I think, derived out of the um, lower number of items in that lower AOV. While lower AOV is not always a good trend, I think it really is helping us zero in as merchants and inventory managers to see what it is we need to get in front of the consumers and also potentially get into a, a, a more aggressive sale mode to clear out that inventory as well. So let's change uh, speeds a little bit here. First call out is this is actually some ex external data from the retail pulse. You can see the attribution down there of where you can see these charts. But one of the things we wanted to understand was all of the data previously we've highlighted is actual on-channel or on, sorry, on-property behavior that we're observing within the brand websites. But this is now thinking about what is the marketing spend and how are uh, retailers getting the clients or getting the consumer to their site. So when you think about this, this is a performance benchmark as it relates to the spend that retailers and different sectors are using to get that traffic there. So when we th we're first going to break it down by um, what we might call um, channels. So in other words, an omni-channel retailer versus a pure play. First, we'll talk about omni-channel. So the interesting trend, as you see, is Facebook spend is up when we think about this in a uh, performance benchmark week over week, while the Google spend is down. So the initial assumption might be all of that Google spend is transferring over to Facebook. But I think what we know inherently is our Google spend is a multiple of what is usually our social or Facebook spend. So again, while we definitely see more money going into that channel and subsequently we've seen it supported with the traffic, the traffic coming from that channel, um, I don't think it's fair to say that all of the uh, extra or additional Google spend is being pushed into Facebook, but it makes sense that this trend is happening. As we've all spent more time at home, we are spending more time on devices and we are spending more time in social media. So it makes sense that we're going to migrate some of our marketing dollars to make sure that we're in front of the consumers where we see them. But we thought this was an interesting trend that the Omni Channel has pushed a little bit there. And we're seeing a, and the uh, Retail Pulse is seeing a drop in the overall Google spend. When we look at that in the pure play, what's notable is while the Facebook spend is up, uh, comparatively to the Google, they're both running uh, below what are the week over week norms. So pure plays appear to be pulling back uh, some of their marketing spend overall. And I think that's due, we think that's due to both competition as well as uh, some potential challenges again with just trying to get through this time and understand what the operating budgets and operating models look like in this uh, time of uncertainty. So again, key takeaways here, understand your marketing mix, understand where you're seeing that referring traffic and make sure you're allocating uh, the marketing spend in those channels that's driving the traffic and the transactions at this point. When we think about this by vertical, we thought this was very interesting. So this is a case where uh, within the fashion vertical, again, not necessarily uh, having a huge spike in traffic, doing okay with conversions, we see a huge pullback here, almost 50%. And as close to 70% there in early April of pullback from the Google spend. That's a material budget pullback that, that some of it certainly is going into some additional Facebook spend, but certainly that's not making up that delta. So this is telling us that, that within the fashion sector, we are seeing people really evaluate the spend on a day-to-day -day level and being very, very conservative about where they're at right now with their money. 
um, and trying to understand how that budget for April uh, is going to maybe last through this time of uncertainty with the same revenue and same return on ad spend not coming in. Interesting comparable here. So with the essentials, it's the inverse. Money is being spent uh, at a huge multiplier for the essentials in both channels, but really in that Google spend. We know that that's the more expensive and uh, more competitive space. So it's an interesting thing to see the focus um, for this vertical of essentials, knowing that there is a lot of um, opportunity here, but also a lot of challenge within the essentials uh, the inventory has been difficult to manage for a lot of retailers or a lot of brands. And so there's a lot of, um, I think, interplay going on between what is the spend mixed with what is the time to be in market, knowing you need to be uh, very mindful about having the, uh, the product that you're obviously in market promoting. So uh, another theme to pull out there, while the marketing mix is something you're obviously evaluating all the time, getting aggressive makes a lot of sense make sure that you're in lockstep with your inventory and your merchandise availability as it relates to where you may be doubling down on some of your spend. So what are some of the, the summaries of what we've seen? Overall, retailers saw through the DY platform, uh, overall user and purchasers increase as the seriousness of COVID-19 uh, really came into play within the, the mass media. As the weeks progress, though, and March ended, uh, we do see more card abandonment. But again, the one thing we want to highlight there is that is an opportunity for remarketing and retargeting. So while it's not necessarily a great individual metric uh, within the broader picture, that's certainly a positive. Year over year, the purchases have increased, and that makes sense. But going into point four there, keep in mind, we do see the smaller baskets in terms of quantity. And so we do see the lower AOV being very mindful of what can you mine from an analysis perspective about what customers are coming to your site looking for specifically. Uh, turning into point five and point six in summary, the spend, Facebook spend seems to be going up as again, we believe that more traffic, we're seeing more traffic come from the social refers. Um, so trying to get more spend into those spaces. Uh, and the Google marketing is up dramatically in the essentials vertical, not necessarily in some of the other ones, uh, but as we alluded to earlier, really important to think about, not just is your spend being effectively, uh, is it effectively performing and getting that ad spend, but is it also working in tandem with things like we said, the smaller uh, average order value and the, the unique transactions that are happening, are you aligning your spend with what customers are coming to buy from? You don't wanna be bringing those customers in if you can't fulfill on what it is they're most likely there to buy from you. Hopefully these are some bullet points that can help you go back to your business, do some quick analysis, maybe make some merchandising and marketing tweaks and improve your overall performance as well as helping the consumer in this uh, uncertain time as well. Which takes us to how we've started to really see some trends in the market. Even the timing, when you think about our, our conversation today, we're really past what is phase one. Uh, phase one was, in essence, crisis management for everybody. As a consumer, we were trying to understand what was available and when. Were we able to go to stores? Did we need to migrate our behavior solely to the online channel? Um, but I think the businesses had, in some cases, an even bigger hurdle to understand. Not only were they trying to still run a business, understand as you're trying to understand what is the business impact of these changes in behaviors, you had some different operating models that were surfacing underneath. Your uh, employees and your operators uh, a lot of times had to start working remote, so you were figuring out some new working methods and some new run models for you just internally, and then you were just putting out fire, fires. What did it mean to your inventory? What did it mean to what might be your customer service? So while these are still challenges, I think the initial communication and some of the initial learnings, we find that a lot of brands have started to find a new operating rhythm. Certainly as consumers, we've started to understand a little more concretely with some of the stay at homes. We know that we need to migrate that behavior online. So we really feel here that we're in this phase two. What is the operational adjustments that we've made? And so as a business, how do we start to capitalize on that, right? And by capitalize, I just mean work more efficiently and being able to help the consumer. Some of the things we highlighted earlier, I think, fall into that in terms of starting to really understand what are those key categories or the key products, making sure they're merchandised properly, understanding on a day-to-day -day basis 
uh, what that marketing spend and how it needs to be tweaked. These are the operational just adjustments that you usually do make on probably broader monthly or even quarterly adjustments. These are things that you need to be looking at in, in really a week over week, if not day over day level. Um, and also supporting what is the change in customer needs. So again, if you think of the example of a omni-channel retailer, you now have understood that those physical locations are closed, the messaging is out, and you've started to um, kind of repurpose and re-communicate what is the best way to engage with you as a brand, what are the expectations that the consumer can now have in terms of delivery or delivery options. Um, so it's really important that you focus in this area to say, okay, based on the new norms of what we as a brand are operating under, and now that the consumer understands, how do we get those messages out in front that are the most important to them and address the biggest themes that you see. Phase three is something we're gonna look at. Um, I think until there is sort of a fixed horizon on when the sort of behavioral changes for the consumers have been lifted, so when there is more freedom, when um, to go back out and shop uh, sort of in the channel that you may choose, when some of the stay at home is lifted, um, certainly when certain parts of the economy are back as it relates to some of the furloughed employees and a little bit more of the uh, economic rush might hit back into the market, we're going to see, I think, some new norms. And that's gonna be both on the customer behavior as well as on the brand side, how you, how you operate. So we're looking forward to working with you and engaging the community to really understand what some of those new norms might be, but that we're gonna save some of those highlights for a, a later, um, a later webinar. So let's talk a little more about phase one and what we saw with some of the main themes that we're hearing from brands as it relates to the consumer experience. Product assortment, how do we have the right products and understanding what consumers are looking for from us. Fulfillment and delivery, a lot of interruptions in the operational and fulfillment side of things as well as customer service. Customer su support explicitly, how have we been communicating and what is the consumer expecting from us and then ongoing marketing opportunities. So phase one, product assortment. We're seeing huge fluctuations in stock and assortment availability. Um, this was quite logical, right? There was no way to plan uh, both as it related to available inventory, but I think also from suppliers to be able to know, A, what were gonna be these peak items, and B, how to get an ongoing replenishment going for you to be back in there. So the consumers uh, certainly are doing a lot of shopping, if you think about the grocery model, people are keeping carts in multiple providers uh, to really understand when does that window open up. Similar here as it relates to a retailer, um, I think the, the key here is clear communication of the availability of product. And then to the second point, when can that delivery happen? One thing I really wanna call out that is a positive um, within the current time frame is even Amazon cannot always fulfill on their two-day promise. And that's okay from a consumer's perspective. The key thing here is that there's clarity of when are those products going to be delivered and or what is the availability. From a brand perspective, why that's important is no longer do we, or is there that uh, sort of omnipresent challenge of the free two-day delivery. You don't have to meet that level of expectation. If you can get the product there within a seven to day, 10 day window, that is very, very much within the level set expectations that consumers are now seeing based on those high demand products. So the big key we're saying here is be very clear with the availability and be very clear with what is that expectation. The other thing we would call out, and Alex will get to some of these examples later, I think this is a time to really evaluate since everything is happening in a more measured delivery time, can you uh, offer that free delivery? Certainly as consumers, because we're giving up some of the urgency of when that can be delivered, uh, free shipping is still a differentiator and an expectation from the consumer. Um, customer support, in phase one, I think it was understanding where were the trouble spots, what was the communication method that the, the, uh, our visitors and our consumers were having with us. Now that we have some of that data, we should be able to update our messaging a little bit better to either proactively answer those questions or be able to deflect some of those uh, with maybe some modeling of which channel you'd like to facilitate that conversation with. And then ongoing marketing, much like we said, we saw a dramatic shift in uh, both efficiency of the spend, uh, kind of what the, the breadth of marketing channels were. So just understanding how can you stand out in some really competitive areas and probably pulling back in those areas that really 
um, aren't material right now uh, within the, the current marketplace. So phase two, what can we discuss and what, what do we explore here? So with this new customer intent around product assortment, how can we take advantage of some of the flexibilities we have and some of the intelligence we have to be able to push the right products in front of the consumers? We now understand what we understand what those best performing products are. We understand what our inventory seasonality, micro seasonality is. Um, so it's really a chance to, to do some uh, CX up leveling there. Fulfillment and delivery mentioned this, really setting the expectations clearly and promoting that where you think it's a benefit. Customer support, deflection, clear communication about what the expectation is of availability of different services, and even opening up what might be different support channels. Uh, we've really seen the hospitality industry take the lead here as it related to um, loyalty status, uh, modifications of how you accrue points, knowing that people aren't able to travel, and then the extension of some of those programs beyond the typical 12-month cycle, knowing that people wouldn't be able to meet that same criteria. So how can you as a customer support or loyalty model think about that as well? And then the marketing, as we've mentioned often here, uh, how do you think about more mindful spend there? So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alex so he can walk through some of the effective use cases we're seeing across the Dynamic Deal platform. Thanks, Nathan. All right, let's get into some use cases that we can deploy to um, deal with some of the problems that have arisen. So the first problem is the problem of product assortment. We know that certain products have been wildly popular. Products like hand sanitizer, for example, um, are really difficult to keep in stock. Um, other products, meanwhile, are really difficult to sell right now. So how do you keep the essential products in stock um, while also trying to push inventory out the door for the less popular products. One tactic is to suppress um, the products that are dangerously low of, you know, dangerously low and at risk of uh, going out of stock suppressed from your uh, recommendations. That way, the users that do find those products will have found them organically through your site search or arriving directly from them or with navigation, they won't be pushed upon them with recommendations. Um, then recs can be used to push some of your, your products that you need to sell through. All right, so this is a use case I highly suggest. If you sell products that are relevant um, to this new lifestyle that we've all adopted where we're working from home and spending all of our time at home, put up a recommendation widget highlighting those products of your assortment um, that sell well during this time. So if you're an electronics store, you should be putting up your, your gaming systems, your um, you know, Alexa home, your Google home, all those things that, uh, or your monitors, all those things that facilitate a, an easier work from home life. Uh, I highly suggest using bundles um, as an alternative to um, just a, a straight discount promotion. If you need to get rid of certain products uh, and clear inventory, um, so you can bundle in less popular products uh, as an add on, uh, an extra incentive to buying some of your more popular products that people want to check out with. That allows you to save the margin that you would otherwise spend on just giving someone a percentage off discount and allows you to move that inventory. A kind of the reverse of that, which is also effective, is to use a super relevant product for this time right now and use that as a incentive to get people to buy products that are less relevant. Um, so let's use the example of a sporting goods store again. Um, it's difficult to sell, sell sneakers right now, but what's more relevant is a yoga mat. So you can consider a bundling promotion where if you spend $200, on sneakers, you get a free yoga mat that can be used right now to work out from home. Uh, this one is critical. So in all likelihood, you're going to have some products that do sell out, and it may be a while before you're able to restock them with everyone's supply line issues right now. If you do have products that sell out, you need to make sure that for the customers that land on that page, uh, they're given alternatives uh, and similar products so that they don't bounce from this page. You should be leaning on algorithms uh, like similarity to surface alike products that can fill their needs that was not met by this out-of-stock product. 
So when those products do come back into stock, um, here's a way that you can make hay of that event. Um, so you can promote it um, in a prominent spot on your site, uh, touting that it's back in stock, showing a recommendation widget of the most popular or relevant products that have come back into stock recently. Also, you can plan ahead of the eventual restock by capturing some way of following up one-on-one -on -one with customers from the out-of-stock product page. So if a user opts into getting notifications uh, about a product that is out of stock, then you can follow up once it comes back into stock. Uh, and that can be very effective at driving sales without having to lean on some of your paid acquisition channels. All right, some of you might find yourself in the situation where you've sold out of a lot of products and it's difficult to get them back into stock uh, in any foreseeable uh, time frame. So how do you monetize the traffic that does come to your site? Well, I'd highly suggest that you set yourself up in a good position to capitalize on you know, a strong connection with that customer once you do have products again. So definitely make one-to-one -one connections with them. If capturing an email address is the most uh, valuable connection, then ask that of your customers first, and then you can waterfall to other connections, um, like following you on Instagram or signing up for SMS alerts. So just that you waterfall from most impactful to lowest impactful. All right, let's talk about some of the issues around fulfillment and delivery and how you can address those. We're in a time where um, certain products are wildly popular, so much so that uh, it may require uh, setting exploding carts such as this. So a three minute countdown timer where you have to check out or else your products are removed from your cart. You've probably seen this um, in, you know, when, you've, when you're buying tickets to a concert. Well, well, now it can be useful to make sure that you have um, products available for, to meet the demand that's out there. Uh, you wanna make sure that you can serve as many customers as possible. You don't want inventory being earmarked for someone who's just gonna sit um, with it in their cart. This will encourage a higher conversion rate and also make sure products are sent back into the availability for those who will actually check out with them. If you are lucky enough to sell products such as this, which are wildly popular uh, during COVID-19, it's toilet paper, paper towels, and, and hand sanitizer that are the new, the new gold. So if you sell something like this, um, you're going to want to set a, a threshold, a ceiling for the number of units that an uh, individual customer can purchase. Not only is it you know, practicing good behavior to not hoard things, but it'll also ensure that you are able to spread your inventory out to the maximum number of individual customers because it is more valuable to acquire uh, 10 customers than it is to sell 10 paper towel rolls to one customer. All right, so um, there are a lot of questions right now for consumers about shipping. It is a major concern of theirs and it is a major hurdle to get over uh, before converting them. They have questions about whether or not um, you know, your products will be delayed in shipping. They have concerns about um, a delivery person coming into their home right now. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're communicating all of the possible shipping options that are available to them. Standard shipping, drop it off at my door, you know, um, touchless delivery, I think they're calling it. Uh, and then you also wanna offer uh, premium delivery methods to get it there faster, uh, but you can obviously charge more for that. Okay, instituting delivery windows, I believe is important if you're, you know, someone like Amazon or selling something where you're, you're delivering a lot of products to many different people in a neighborhood. Uh, the reason you wanna communicate uh, the fact that you're working with delivery windows up front is because it's very frustrating to get to the end of a checkout only to be gated from purchasing by uh, delivery windows that are no longer available. So you want to make sure that you're selecting and communicating delivery windows up front um, and making that very clear to your customers that you are instituting delivery windows. All right, let's talk about uh, customer support and loyalty at this time. 
uh, it's really a time to be flexible and paint outside of the lines here and maybe break some of the, um, you know, the procedures and processes and, and rules that you currently have in place uh, in order to deliver a, an experience to customers that they're really going to appreciate right now. So I'll give you a moment to read this quote from Deloitte. Putting flexible refund pricing and change policies in place and finding other ways to help your customers through this crisis will be beneficial to the long-term health of your company. And it, yeah, and I, I believe that. I think this section is about doing right by your customers, whether that means changing your, your regular practices or not. All right, so this particular use case uh, we've seen everywhere. It's really table stakes at this point. Um, but it is really important that you're being transparent and honest about how the COVID-19 situation is impacting your business, your customers, potentially your employees. Be open and honest about it. It's okay if you're experiencing um, difficulty, you know, delivering it within the typical time period. That's common. It's better to be upfront and, upfront and honest about that. And um, you want to make that you know, clear that you understand what the situation is. Customers are going to uh, appreciate it. If you are a company who is selling um, you know, essential goods like food or other products that are, are really important right now uh, that warrant more real-time updates, I suggest that you add an option for your users to sign up for real-time updates, either through email or some other channel. So right now, customer success and customer support teams are inundated with questions, questions around <clears throat> when their product's going to arrive, questions about um, contamination, questions about um, returning a product. You know, many more people are returning their products right now because they haven't had a chance to try them in store. So a ton of questions to save your customer support team from dealing with all of these one by one, you should update your FAQ section and make that section available and prominently linked to from your site. And make sure the content is relevant to the questions that people are asking right now, which are related to COVID-19. All right, so with the goal of supporting the customer uh, support people, we want to take as much work as we can off of their hands. Um, so we need to streamline uh, shoppers into the right support channels. So collecting information about what their problem is and funneling them into the proper and most efficient way to answer their question. If that's an FAQ page, then you can send them there. If that's a chat bot, then, uh, and you have a chat bot, uh, you can deploy that. If that's calling up a customer support person, then you can escalate to there. Um, try and reduce the friction and also have a, uh, an eye towards uh, reducing the load of your customer support team, reduce frustrations all around. So we've seen that Geo has been um, a real differentiator in terms of customer behavior right now um, because of the, the differing responses from uh, governments uh, around the world, but also within the United States here. Uh, different states have responded with different ordinances. So here in New York, we're required to stay pretty much at home. Um, that's not the case everywhere. Some stores are closed and some are not. So you need to communicate this geo-based personalized information to your shoppers based on where they're at now. So tell them if there's their store is closed and where the, you know, the nearest open store is, or if they're all closed, let them know that. So we, we need to do right by our customers, like I said, and um, one of the biggest stresses right now for consumers is financial. Um, it's a scary time to buy things. So let's try and mitigate that risk for our customers by uh, using flexible payment options, similar to a firm. So any sort of payment option that allows you to defer payments over time is going to be really popular here. It's going to improve your conversion rates. Um, and do right by your customers at the same time. All right, so how do we sell during this period of time? A lot, a lot of people have turned to promotions um, and it's led to a very noisy uh, ecosystem with 
everything on sale. So how do you cut through that noise um, and really get the most out of the promotions you do run? This particular use case I like a lot because um, it has an eye towards the third stage where we get out of this and brands that have, have done things well will be in a position to um, you know, capitalize on successful promotions. Um, so this is looking towards the recovery stage. Uh, this promotion gates the 25% off and makes it exclusive to members of their loyalty program. Encouraging loyalty program signups, increasing lifetime value for the, for the members who do choose to sign up, setting themselves up for a, a good recovery stage. This use case does a, a, an awesome job at setting the, uh, the brand up for success in the recovery stage as well. So they're using promotions to coach good lifetime value behavior into their customers. They know that certain products, and the purchase of those products lead to uh, lifetime customers and um, high LTV. So they're using those products to as their, their promotion. So they're putting those products on sale for new customers. Once you've established a connection with the brands, they know that they need to then push you into new categories. So they're using promotions for existing customers that push people into new, more valuable categories. Um, and this way they're personalizing and coaching um, good LTV behavior using promotions. So many brands right now are, are turning off their uh, acquisition spend or they're turning it way down. So we need to make up that traffic somehow. So you really want to get the most out of your return traffic and make sure they're coming back uh, more often than normal. One way to do that is to make it exciting and mysterious every time you come back to the site and get something new. This is a cool use case that's using this scratch off offer that's different each day. User comes back to the site, there's a new daily deal. It's pretty exciting. The scratch off adds to the mystery of it, makes me want to come back to the site tomorrow. If you're a brand that has continued spending for paid acquisition, you need to get the most out of the paid acquisition that's touting these promotions that are all around the internet right now. So there's a lot of competition. Um, and the last thing you want is to pay for an ad that brings someone to site and then just has them bounce when they don't find um, that the promoted category is actually what they want. So we need to give, we need to give traffic that lands on your site ways to find and explore other categories that are also on sale. Another great way to, to cut through the noise of all these promotions is to change it up. And instead of a promotion or you know, a percentage off of sales, send a percentage of your sales to charity. So you can make a statement and put your brand in a good light um, and also increase sales with this because it has a lot of the same ingredients of a successful promotion. It has urgency. At least it does if you set a time limit for the, um, the period where you're going to donate to charity, which I, I suggest you do. It also has you know, this aspect of added value to the purchase. With the sale, the added value is getting, getting more for your money. With this, I'm also getting more for my money because I'm purchasing just like I would have anyways, but I'm giving back to charity, so I feel good about myself. I feel good about your brand, um, so it's a win-win. Thank you to everyone who joined. I know this is a really difficult period, so I hope some of the use cases we discussed help you and your brands get through this and come out on the other side stronger. Um, please check in with the COVID-19 Marketing Resource Center. Um, we'll be updating that consistently with more of our thoughts on how to respond to the COVID-19 situation uh, when it comes to personalization. Thanks again, Nathan. So it's always a pleasure. Be well, everyone. Take care.